This week we want to move to Module 13 and talk about independent comics and some of the superheroes coming out of those. So the weirdness and subversion unleashed by Watchmen and other major label comics of the 80s served to pollinate the next wave of writers, artists, and independent comic labels. So some of the younger artists, inspired by the work of Alan Moore and Frank Miller, began their ascent towards their own Marvel and DC titles. Others left their scripting, penciling, and inking jobs and jumped in with some of the new imprints that arose in the 80s and 90s, such as Image, Dark Horse, Fantagraphics, Vertigo, and the short-lived Epic, um, which was run by Marvel. Below are some of the titles and characters that arose from that fruitful period. So we have Spawn, which was created by Todd McFarlane in 1992, and this really paved the way for other artist-owned titles. So other artists realized that um, what Todd McFarlane was able to do with Spawn um, was definitely the best way to jumpstart their careers and potentially make more money. Um, we also have Hellboy, which is created by Mike Mignola in 1993 for Dark Horse Comics, and it spawned numerous spinoffs, such as Lobster Johnson, and it continues to run. Moving a little further away from the mainstream, we have Charlie and Flytrap and Cobalt 60, um, both bloody dystopian titles that first ran in Epic Illustrated in the early 80s, uh, although Cobalt 60 was created years earlier. And um, you can definitely see uh, a, a version of that character in uh, the Ralph Bakshi movie, Wizards. Um, Epic Illustrated was published until 1986, while the Epic imprint ran until 1996. And Epic Illustrated was kind of like uh, heavy metal. Next, we have The Sandman, which is written by Neil Gaiman, uh, who literally was a protege of Alan Moore's and uh, running in DC and Vertigo from 1988 to 1996. So Vertigo was created uh, right after Sandman had started, and it seemed like a, a more apt place to put that. Um, its origin was very similar to Watchmen, so... They originally were going to have Gaiman use some obscure DC licensed characters, but those were abandoned in favor of an original storyline. We also have Concrete, which first appeared in Dark Horse Presents, uh, and that ran until the end of the 90s. So artist writer Paul Chadwick was another Marvel penciler uh, he, who worked on the Dazzler, uh, who was one of the X-Men, before he jumped ship. And then moving even further away from the mainstream, um, we have the Hernandez Brothers Love and Rocket series and Charles Burns' Hard-Boiled Defective and Skin Deep anthologies. Um, and uh, Charles Burns was also an uh, uh, album art um, artist. Um, and he had some of the unforgettable heroes such as El Borba and uh, Big Baby, which are very strange characters. Um, also on Fantagraphics, which is where Burns stuff ended up, um, which specializes in publishing the work of underground artists, many of whom began as um, self-publishers, is uh, Dan Klaus Eight Ball, um, which in its final issue presented The Legend of Death Ray, um, which is actually kind of a superhero piece, but he's either a superhero or a supervillain, depending on whether or not you're his friend. So you don't really know. But that was the very last issue of 8-Ball. And unlike mainstream comic artists, these guys pencil, ink, script, and color each panel themselves. So that's why books like uh, Klaus' um, Patience or Burns' Black Hole uh, took five and ten years to complete, respectively. No monthly titles there. And then returning closer to the normal world are independent works of Grant Morrison and Mark Miller, who, who both worked for uh, DC and Marvel. And um, they need to work outside of the normal canons to really let their freak flags fly. Uh, and they definitely do. So Miller created his own imprint, uh, Miller World, to run Wanted and Kick-Ass, while Morrison used Vertigo, uh, which was just retired this year and rebadged as DC Black Label uh, for The Invisibles and The Filth, both of which are way too adult for the kiddies' comic, comic rack. And my kids can't even read them yet. They're still too young. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, but if you folks read all of these, uh, you will come out on the other side well-versed in out there comics and possibly unfit to continue as a functioning member of society. But uh, definitely some good titles to find here. Uh, Comixology has a fair number of them. I have a fair number of them too, but you know we're not doing that meeting in person thing. So our notes for our film this week, which is Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, so 
It was directed by Guillermo del Toro, who also did Pan's Labyrinth and the first Hellboy. And it was written by del Toro and also uh, Mike Mignola, who um, is responsible for the story, even though we'll we'll see that it doesn't really come from a specific Hellboy comic. So this is the sequel to 2004's Hellboy, which was enjoyable, yet maybe a little light in tone for a movie with demons and Nazis. That's just in my Um, opinion, although it's still a great film. This film jettisons the World War II baggage and the drippy Agent Myers, who everybody hated, well, especially Hellboy, and goes for Del Toro's usual themes of magic and spirituality, fighting for existence in a hostile modern world. Uh, Those are themes that are in all of his films. Uh, Inventively covers the opening backstory using minimalist animation. So the budget was big for this film, but not big enough to do all of that with live action. And for years, there was talk of a Hellboy 3, but that was scrapped in favor of a reboot in 2019, for which there will be no sequels. Trust me, it's just not going to happen. If any of you saw the, the Hellboy reboot, you, you understand. So the comic origin, there isn't one, strangely enough, aside from coming from Hellboy. Um, there was talk to adapt one of the existing stories, um, as with Hellboy, which came from uh, the Seed of Destruction um, storyline. Uh, which was the, the very first series of Hellboy. But Mignola and Del Toro opted to create a new story involving elves and fairies, which definitely goes along with the uh, usual themes that um, Del Toro prefers. The one staple character from the comic that was introduced in Hellboy 2 was uh, Johann Krauss, who first showed up in uh, the B- BPRD spinoff series Hollow Earth Number 1. And then King Balor and Prince Nuada are actual figures from uh, Celtic and Irish mythology, although, although their roles are kind of reversed. Nuada was the one-armed king killed by Balor, the, the one-eyed monster. Um, and I think I mentioned this in uh, way back in Module 1. Uh, and then Nuada, Nuada's henchman, uh, Mr. Wink, um, was named after actor Selma Blair's one-eyed dog. Although Mr. Wink looks nothing like a dog. So there's speculation that the Hellboy reboot from 2019 stemmed partly from Mignola's desire to realign the character more closely with the comics. And this is perhaps the only thing that that film did successfully. Um, this film is very much um, a Guillermo del Toro film, so which is good for that. But if you're a comic artist, maybe you have other opinions. So our synopsis, a young Hellboy hears the story of elvish King Balor and the the Golden Army on Christmas Eve long ago, which suggests that the story will be important and somehow connected, and of course it is. Um, As Balor's exiled son, Nuada, begins collecting pieces of the controlling crown, Hellboy, Abe Sapien, Liz, and the rest of the BPRD step in to control the ruckus which involves trolls, fairies, elves, forest elementals, angels of death, and other beings hiding in the Earth's forgotten crevices. (laughs) 